So uh, interesting journey that we've been on, right? We started out with uh, just a big overview of where we were going. Um, we looked at five of the essentials of the faith, did an overview of that. Now we're working through them. Um, we looked at the Trinity. We looked at scriptures. Uh, and we looked at the Trinity. We moved into God the Father, then God the Son. Uh, and now we're going to move from there into the gospel. So we're all set up from what we've done before to talk about the gospel. The things that uh, we have a sacred stewardship for, the essential things, the main things, lots of things we can talk about and do in a church, but, but uh, these truths, learning them, teaching them, passing them down, um, uh, critical to, uh, to what it means to be a true church. And tonight, the gospel and I'm going to narrow this down a bit because we could spend a long time talking about the gospel, I'm trying to narrow it down to, uh, to one lesson. But next week, we'll talk about hope. So we'll go to the resurrection. We'll go to the, the uh, hope of the return of Christ. Won't touch on that this tonight, but uh, um, entrusted, entrusted with the gospel. Yeah. So, uh, just the first question out of that, are we clear about the gospel? Do we know how to say the gospel, proclaim the gospel in our world today? You feel like that's something that uh, you feel comfortable with? You feel like that's something that our church feels comfortable with? Certainly, uh, you know, our, our uh, lead pastor uh, comes to it quite often. It's, it's an uh, intention of his to proclaim the gospel often in his preaching. Well, last Sunday was, a, uh, this past Sunday, a great example of that with, uh, with him taking Paul's conversation with Felix and then expounding it out to a proclamation of the reality of, of judgment. Um, so what do you think? Are we clear about the gospel? Do you think the average person in our church would know how to um, proclaim the gospel. I think we get muddled in what details are essential to tell or important to mm -hmm. tell. Because you could get in a whole lot of details and never actually get to Jonah, death and resurrection. Yeah. You know, I've been right. changed. Yeah, changed my life. And yeah, and like, but then I like would leave out the repent part. Like, you have to repent. Because so Christ repent. died for my sins and yeah. go from there. So yeah. Like, I would just only include the second half, not the first half. Yeah. 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 That's uh, not uncommon um, to focus on yourself and what what you believe has happened to you. But leave out the, here's what Christ did. Here's what God planned. Here's, um, so here's a, um, our, there's a fellow named uh, Greg Gilbert, and he's written about this. Um, and this book is called, What is the Gospel? And here's one of the things he says up front. He's quite, quite frank and stark with his view of what evangelicalism looks like. And he says, in some ways, I'm glad to see Christians getting excited when a discussion about the gospel begins. It means they're taking it seriously. That's good, right? If people take the gospel seriously, um, if believers do, that's great. There would be nothing healthy at all in Christians who don't care less how we define and understand the gospel. So there's the, okay, getting excited about it's one thing, but uh, being able to clearly express it truthfully express it um, with understanding really matters. Um, why do you think that's true? That statement. Why do you think that's true? Sorry to say. To care about how we define and understand the gospel. Well. Yeah. 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 And is it likely you're, you'll encounter somebody who 
um, doesn't agree with what you say or can say, well, I don't think that really matters. Um, he says, on the other hand, I think the energy generated about the discussion of the gospel, so this excitement about it, points to a general fog of confusion that swirls around it these days. That even a lot of Christians don't really clearly understand or clearly know how to express or explain the gospel. When you come right down to it, Christians don't just agree on what the gospel is, just don't agree on what the gospel is. It means there's, there's uh, different ways that they think to explain it, which are different from others. Um, and there's disagreements over that. Even Christians who call themselves evangelical. So his point, as he's writing this book, is he wants people to walk away from this. It's a very short book. He wants people to walk away with this with a clear understanding of what is the gospel um, and in the context of why that matters. So he unfolds that in this, in this uh, um, little book. And we're going to see that it's clear in the scriptures, but as you said, false truths, false beliefs, the church continued to encounter challenges to the expression of the gospel. And in some, when we've seen early heresies, and that was part of that, uh, is don't believe in who Christ is, deny that, and you're going to deny the gospel. Um, and there's, there were also a lot of disagreements in the church over the gospel. We're going to see some of that too. So we've talked about this stewardship and what it means. We've talked about three things. One is biblical revelation. What does the Bible say? So the gospel is in the Bible. Uh, and there's uh, great links in some that it go to explain it. I mean, the book of Romans, most of that is... Paul explaining the gospel, um, confessing the gospel, um, and doing it intentionally because he knows that there are Jews that are still denying the Messiah, that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, and he also knows that there's disagreements among Christians because there's Jews that are seeking to uh, make those who believe the gospel practice the law. Faithful, careful expression, so that's gonna happen from the scriptures, faithful expression. And we look at what does church history say about that? How is this truth been guarded and taught? Because the, the early church fathers and then moving on, they really cared about the truth of the gospel. They really cared about the words in scripture about the gospel. Some of them cared in ways that may have been, you know, a little too, uh, okay, you're spending too much time thinking about that. You're really not, you've kind of lost, lost the center of what, what the gospel is by going that direction. Um, we're going to see a little bit of that in a bit. And then finally, practically, why is this truth important? How do we apply it? Well, eternal salvation, yep. And being able to uh, speak the gospel, share the gospel, uh, answer questions that people have about about your proclamation of the gospel, those are critically important uh, to be able to do that. They may still disagree with you. They may walk away saying, I don't believe that, but your ability to at least be able to say it truthfully and biblically um, is, is important. Remember that behind that, it's not just you saying it, it's the Holy Spirit working in, in the heart and mind of that believer to convict them of the truth of the gospel. <coughs> And we see that over and over again in the book of Acts. Um, so the sacred stewardship, we look at you know, the five different periods of history, the ancient church, the apostolic time, and right afterwards, the Middle Ages, medieval church, Reformation, um, moving past that into more modern era, and then into the present. And here are three things that really mattered uh, we've seen some of this early. When we talked about Scripture, we began this to look at how the regular fide, the rule of faith, the rule of truth, the, uh, those leading churches really cared about what, does, what did the Scripture say? How did the apostles teach that? 
Um, and we want to maintain that. And when false teachings are coming up, we want to be able to circle the wagons and, de and defend against those false teachings, make sure our people understand it. So they're taking very seriously um, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and, and with the purpose of the gospel. That was their, that was their goal. Um, they're guarding the gospel. Um, so salvation um, has a, at least in the church, a faithfulness to the proclamation of the gospel. Uh, I said earlier, there's lots of things we could be doing, but if we lose sight of proclaiming the gospel, you know, we're doing something, but it's, you know, it's missing what, uh, what people desperately need to hear, the gospel. Um, and uh, there are a number of evangelical churches that do a lot of great things, but they've, the, the gospel is somewhere, but it's, it's not prominent in what they do. And then uh, we've talked about the seminal doctrines of the Christian faith, fidelity and doctrinal development. So as, as, as new ideas come up in the culture, new ideas come up, uh, being able to be faithful to the gospel, but also do it in a way that you can address those things that are happening differently um, throughout history. So that's been, a, that's been a practice that the true church has tried to carry on up until the present day, uh, these three things. And the big concept is how do you say and how do you answer questions about the gospel? How do you say it? Um, so let's look at the beginnings of stewarding the gospel. So we see in the New, Ter New Testament narratives, the gospel is proclaimed. In the gospels, in Acts, we see clear proclamations of the gospel happening. It's proclaimed. And then you get to the epistles. And in the epistles, the gospel is not only proclaimed, but it's also explained. And particularly in Paul's writings, he's proclaiming the gospel, but he's also explaining the gospel. We're going to look at a verse that, that shows us that in just a moment. Uh, and in the New Testament epistles, there's references that the gospel is taught. So Paul did not just, and others did not just write those letters, but they were actually... In the churches they were, they, they were planting and going to, they are teaching the gospel. They're giving clear instruction. It's a big change. It's brand new. Um, and for those who have fallen to other beliefs, well, because Christ has come, right? <laughs> it's, yes, it's in the Old Testament, but the newness is Christ has come. <laughs> Matt smiled at me. <laughs> that was an, that was an uh oh smile. By the way, it's good that Matt's here because one of the things he talked about today um, in his lesson on um, on uh, sovereignty and authority is is that uh, it's important for for uh, for your elders and pastors and and teachers to be corrected if they're not doing something appropriate, right? So, that's why it's good to have them here in the room. <laughs> in the early church writings, it's also evident the gospel is taught to new believers. So we've talked about the creeds, we've looked at those, and the creeds that speak about God the Father, God the Son, we've looked at those. But those were, those were also tools to help proclaim the gospel, teach the gospel. Why was it important that they confess that God, God the Son, Jesus Christ is God the Son incarnate. Because without that, there's no salvation. This is why he came. Um, and they're explained in contrast to other faiths and false gospels. So you see that happening. And that continues on, but it's very prominent just in what you see happening in the early church. So Here's some of the challenges to a, to a uh, faithful expression of the gospel. We've looked at God, the Son, Jesus Christ. We've looked at people that denied that was true about him. And also, there's denial, denial about what he really accomplished on the cross. 
um, in his death and resurrection. Um, sin and the fall. Uh, so um, what, it, what is sin? Is it true that, that uh, sin is passed on from Adam, totally depraved? Um, or are you born innocent? Um, did that sin truly get passed on to every human being after Adam's sin, except for the incarnate son? The nature of the atonement, lots of theories about how Christ paid for our sins on the cross, what that meant. Grace, faith, the sacraments or ordinances, and election perseverance. So these are all elements of the gospel. Um, we're going to look at the four that are highlighted in white for just a bit, kind of walk through those a bit. Um, so here's 1 Corinthians 15. And I think Jason used this passage uh, Sunday. Uh, now I make known to you, brothers and sisters, so this is, the, this is late in the letter, but this is the whole chapter is about the resurrection, uh, about the, uh, uh, Paul's explaining that. But he begins with um, reminding them of what they've been taught. Now I make known to you, brothers and sisters, the gospel which I preach to you, which you also received, in which you stand, by which you were also saved, if you hold for, uh, if you hold firmly to the word which I preach to you. He's saying it again, you heard this. Um, so he's just reminding them about what they heard. Unless you believed in vain, unless you nodded your head, but you really didn't believe it. You're just nodding your head because, oh man, that Paul, he's such a, wow. Um, for I handed down to you as a first importance. So think about that for a minute. I mean, he's constantly talking about Christ. Constantly talking about Christ. But he says, of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So there it is, just a simple statement about what Paul, you know, Paul says it you know, like three different times. I preach this to you, I preach this to you, I handed this down to you. And you received it, at least I think you did. Some of you may not have. And so we need to hear it again. Um, and then he's going to go into the resurrection because um, he says it's foolish for us to preach this if there's no resurrection. But Paul is is reminding us that it's not just what you read in the scriptures, but it's continuing to proclaim the gospel, teach it, remind others about what it means, uh, keep it at the forefront. Um, and so that really simple gospel right there, Christ died for our sins according to scriptures. He was buried, raised on the third day according to scriptures. Let's take a look back at the confessional statements that we've looked at and see where the gospel is in these. So here's the Nicene Creed. For us humans and for our salvation, he, that's, that's God the Son, came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Now he goes on to talk about raised from the dead, resurrection, uh, but... It doesn't, it's not an expansive statement about the gospel, but he does say this is why the Son came, for our salvation. Um, and for our sake, he was crucified. Simple statement. Now, that's the confession, but behind that, there's instruction of this confession. So believers were, new believers were learning this confession and being taught what it meant. There's teaching that went on before they were baptized in the early church. So they'd, they'd have the confession. This is one that everyone agreed on, but they were taught from that. Got, got an instruction about what the gospel means. Constantinople Creed says the same thing. For us humans and for our salvation, this is just, a, they do a little building on from the Nicene Creed in 381, but 
for us humans and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnated of the Holy Spirit in the Virgin Mary, became fully human for our sake. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. So there you go, 325 to 381. The confession is the same. The instruction is the same. The teaching, just like Paul did, is the same. Um, and the, um, the new believer um, hopefully had, was a believer with a, with a true faith, hopefully wasn't in vain, but they understood. They were being taught the gospel, what Christ did. Chalcedon, we looked at this uh, last week. So this was in the, in the mid-fifth century. Um, remember, it's defining that Christ is fully God, fully man, no confusion, no division. Um, and uh, as it begins, in all things like unto us without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead, and in these latter days, for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the mother of God, according to the manhood. And it goes on to, because it's working out um, who God the Son in human flesh is, it's working out all those things. But it's got the Nicene Creed attached to it, but when it begins its expression of God the Son in human flesh to defend against those false teachings, it begins with for us and for our salvation. It's in there. And again, this would be a confession that was taught um, and debated over and argued about. But you've got the gospel right there. Christ died for our sins. So we see that in, in the scriptures clearly, right? That's in 1 Corinthians 15. So in the fifth century, there was a fellow named Pelagius and this is the time of Augustine. You've probably heard about Augustine. But here's Pelagius. And Pelagius determines from his study of Scripture that everyone's born innocent. Adam's sin was not transmitted. Has he ever had children? <laughs> no, a lot of those other philosophers had all kinds of stuff to say about marriage and children and how to raise them. They never had any. Or they never lived with it. Well, this is right around the time that uh, that the, that Chalcedon is happening, you know, just prior to that, and he comes out and says, "This is what I believe. Adam's sin did nothing to the next. It did not corrupt the mind, the emotion, and the will. So everyone born is still spiritually alive. They have the opportunity to." be obedient, to not sin. Um, so there's no depravity. It's simply based on your utter ability to not sin. No, 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 go ahead. No, no. Yeah, so he, he, he didn't deny the incarnation. But Yeah. Which means that Christ did not have to die. Well, he did not. That's what I mean, people sin. Yeah. 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 Um, well, so the other thing he says is because he talks about grace. So the grace uh, that God supplies, the, gra the grace that God gives, the grace even through uh, the crucifixion. And he says grace is beneficial because it can strengthen your desire to not sin, but it's not necessary. It really depends on the person. Now, once they sin, Obviously, they need help. And that help generally comes through doing things that are consistent with uh, God's desires and your merits, are, your merits are measured, right? It's a works-based salvation. But this was, I mean, this was a big uh-oh. 
because he's trying to redefine um, uh, the fall. He's trying to redefine uh, our, our, our sinful nature. Um, and the other thing that's happening along with this is, so it started probably back in the mid to late second century, but discussions about infant baptism. And so what's, what's behind some of this is infants. And if infants die, because they can't exercise belief in the gospel, if infants die, what's going to happen to them? So, um, so he, he and others will use that as a way to say, okay, infants are innocent, so no problem if, if, if something happens to them. Everyone's innocent. And he'll say, I never met anybody that wasn't, that didn't, that lived a perfect life, <laughs> but it's possible. Um, so he wants to preserve free will. Uh, he wants to preserve an incorrupt nature. Um, and, uh, and so now it's the race to the finish line to see that you, you can hold to um, being spiritually alive. Augustine, completely opposite. So Augustine responds this. In fact, he writes 14 different, uh, 14 different writings against Pelagius over a span of about 17 years. He's serious about addressing this. Adam's sin corrupts. Yes, uh, you are totally depraved. He corrupts your mind, your emotions, your will, and you're spiritually dead. So there's the two polar ends, right? Um, total depravity and utter inability without what Christ did, without God's grace in sending the Son, about the Son's death on the cross to pay for our sins. Um, and he's going to attack every avenue of that, even talking about marriage. He writes one on marriage because um, there's the idea that's emerging about a word called concupiscence, which means even if you've if you've um, uh, even if you've gotten cleansed from sin, you still have that attraction to sin. Um, and oh boy, is that not prevalent in marriage? Because marriage is primarily to be fruitful and multiply. Um, and there's temptations for those married outside of marriage. There's also things inside of marriage. And he makes that case, and that's interesting. It comes up a few times, even through the Middle Ages. How does how is a marriage, um, how, how does a marriage accomplish the good that's, that it's designed for? Okay, so there's Augustine, so there's Pelagius, there's Augustine, and then a fellow named John Cassian. He pops up in the middle of all this. And he takes a different view. He says, well, Adam's sin really weakened our human nature. It didn't totally deprive, deprave it. We're not totally depraved, but it weakens. And really, we're not spiritually dead, but we're spiritually sick. So we have a deprived nature, but the ability to cooperate with what God's intentions are. Um, grace is necessary, but it's insufficient because it takes our desire to cooperate to accomplish not sinning. So you've got, in this period of time, this is the um, early 400s, through about, um, through actually through past Chalcedon, um, where you've got three different views, basic to salvation. Uh, nature perfectly perfectly clear when you when you're born. Nature totally depraved. Nature just unhealthy. And how they express that and how we're saved completely different. So. Here's an example of a period of time in history where understanding the gospel really matters. Christ died for our sins, for all are in sin, for there is no one who is good, no, not one. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And each of them is working their way towards what happens in the end, what happens on Judgment Day. They're each working their way towards that. So they're not ignoring that, but they're taking their premise of how we're born, the nature we have when we're born, 
and they're exploring that out to see, okay, what needs to happen for the end result? So it's, it be, it's really not just a, a matter of do, are we born innocent or not, it's a matter of the gospel. Right? And Augustine took that very seriously. He, uh, there were about three or four different synods and councils that he, he tried to bring the case against Pelagius. A couple of them that was overturned. Pelagius was 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 a um, uh, what do you call the legal term? Uh, he was uh, what's that? Yeah, acquitted. Um, and then finally those that condemned him. Yeah. And the sadness is, is, is when Cassian brought his ideas in, there's some, there's some points of, of Augustine's theology where he said, well, yeah, this is good. This is right. This is right. Not that, though. Um, for example, that uh, uh, one was that, uh, um, that you can lose your salvation. So they said, um, so this is this is the big the, the big C the folks operating from Chalcedon, saying um, uh, yes these things we agree with but these couple no uh, grace can be uh, grace can be rejected um, so here's Ephesians two this is going to bring up a whole another another issue with the gospel. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even though we were dead in our tra transgressions, uh, made us alive together with Christ. There's Paul saying it all again. By grace you were saved. Grace becomes a major, major word discussed and debated on for centuries. And raised him up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus to demonstrate in the coming ages the surpassing wealth of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. That's a fascinating statement because, yes, that's true. It is demonstrated in the coming ages. But in some of the ages, um, that word grace is challenged. For by grace you are saved through faith. This not from yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not from works that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship being created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand so we may do them. By grace you are saved. By grace you are saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. By grace you are saved. Well, here's the Middle Ages. We're coming out of the time of Augustine <coughs> and moving into the period from the 5th century. Augustus, Augustine Pelagius debating this. And remember, they're debating ab about what grace does. Is it necessary? No. Is it necessary? Yeah, but... You cooperate with it. Is it necessary? Absolutely. Without the grace of God in what he did, we're hopeless. We're lost. So that discussion about the term grace continues. What does it truly mean? What is happening with God's grace? Um, those that say it's not necessary, how do, we, how do we address that? Those that think it's a reward for, for doing good, how do we address that? Um, and so the very challenging period of scholasticism happens beginning about the uh, 10th, 11th century, all the way through um, into the Reformation. And you have these writers that are uh, these thinkers and writers. So scholasticism is, is a form of, of answering the questions, right? Give me the question. Give me the, the, your argument as to why not, and we're going to work through an explanation defending what the truth is. So using reason to answer the questions that people have. There's three large movements that are happening during this time. Three large movements that are, that are both influencing these discussions and that are products from these discussions in some ways. What is grace? Is it necessary? So that's a continued debate that is intensely discussed throughout, through extensively developed counterarguments. So you find some in Augustine, then you get to the 11th, 12th century, and you find here's 
uh, Anselm, who's doing the same thing. Here's Peter Lombard doing the same thing. And then you get to Thomas Aquinas. Um, and oh my gosh, um, he's got these elaborate layout of questions and then arguments against. Um, so here's the questions. Here's the four points of this question. They're denying how God's grace works or what God's grace is. Here's the counter argument. And here's everything that refutes what, what these four things said. And he does that for just volumes, right? Um, so the simple thing of God's grace, by grace we are saved, becomes a mounted debate over what that term means, how it really happens. Um, and then sacraments. Sacraments are a means of grace, beginning with baptism. So, oh yes, God's grace is dispensed in your participation of the sacraments. Baptism, confirmation, um, uh, uh, re, uh, confession, marriage. That's one of the reasons why marriage is talked about so much. Well, there's writings about marriage too because of that. It's a, now a sacrament. But at, at this, during this last period, though, what, how they're defining grace is not the way that we would define grace as Protestants. Right, not. Yeah. Um, because not, not just in how it's applied. Yeah. But what it means. But actually, what is grace? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Because what what is grace? What is God's grace? A free gift. So what it gives is what we don't deserve. As opposed to mercy, which it does not give us what we do deserve. Yeah. Is it, does it happen in the moment? Is it, um, is it from God, the administration of God's plan from eternity past? We'll get into all that, but yeah. I mean, grace is, grace is, uh, um, is God orchestrating that which brings us salvation through Christ. Um, and Grace is consistent in God's administration of, of the plan that he unfolds from creation to all. Right? But it's not, hey, I come to, or I get baptized and my sins are remitted through the baptismal waters because the Holy Spirit is present and God's dispensing his grace in that moment, I come and I take the Lord's Supper and that grace is supplied to strengthen my faith and to work my way towards salvation because God's grace is supplied at the moment of salvation, right? Not progressively throughout everything you do inside the church, through the church, through Christ operating through the sacraments to where I progressively work my way towards salvation. It will happen perhaps at the end. Oh, there's that place called purgatory where those things that have not been supplied yet, the grace that has not been supplied, however much amount that is left to go, um, you wait upon that to receive the grace for which you are finally saved. That's the, the big idea. And they're serious about it. I mean, it, this doesn't happen like overnight that they say, oh, here's the seven. Um, it's a progressive development, beginning with when they discuss infant baptism. That was a key, cat, a key catalyst, the theological adoption of the practice of infant baptism 
because they thought about, wait a minute, what about infants that die? What happens to them? Um, and so you see, um, you see uh, Augustine, and you see these different scholastics, and they are putting that in between the, the arguments against their theology of salvation. Um, in, uh, in, in Augustine's writing against the Pelagians, so he separates two heresies. One's Pelagius, the other is a heresy that he believed in, uh, Manichaeism, and he sets true theology of the scripture about salvation, about, about sin, in the middle. Um, and he uses infant baptism as a key example of why that's true. He, he, he repeats that over and over and over again. Um, and so uh, once you've gotten that in place, then you start working through, well, the Lord's Supper, what about that? And then, well, and then, well. And so finally, in the, about the 12th century, uh, there's now seven. And Peter Lombard's the one that says in his sentences, these are the seven. And two centuries later, at the uh, Council of the Constance, I believe, um, they affirm these are the seven. They declare it. These are officially the seven. So it took a long time for them to make that declaration because they're developing this theology over time. So here's these, here's these individuals who are, on the one hand, they're really trying to defend the faith through answering all these all these false teachings or just wrong ideas. And they're really working through that. But they're also building along the way this theology which results in, here's how salvation happens. It happens through participation in the sacraments, beginning at birth. Right? And at this time, the people who are going through this, they have, they're able to read the Bible, all these people, right? A lot not. Oh yeah. Theologians, I guess, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, uh, you see them quoting scripture uh, again and again and again. So they and you see, okay, well, they're interpreting that. Um, okay, that interpretation seems right, but this one, where they're making that point, uh, no. Uh, so they're they're defending things from Scripture, um, but this theology has taken a life of its own in in the in the Roman Church in the West, and uh, and these individuals, although wanting to defend the true faith of Scriptures, are building alongside of that this idea of how salvation happens, not. Not the point at which you believe, repent and believe, but throughout your life from there on. Um, and so there's the warning bells with that too. Hey, if you stop doing this, then there's no hope for you. And then there's a separation of different kinds of sins. The simple sins and then the really serious sins. Yeah. And then the Reformation, by grace you are saved through faith. I've been getting a quick amount of that, trying to read back over there. I didn't realize that was there. Oh, I'm sorry. Go sorry. Ahead. Pretty cool. I'm, I'm, I'm reading that. I'm, I'm good for the hour. <laughs> by grace you are saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It's the gift of God. There you go. There's God's gift. And so in response to what it been developed in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, the reformers said, no, we got to take that scripture seriously. We got to take Ephesians 2 seriously. Um, faith alone, by grace alone, through Christ alone. That is the gospel. Right? That's what Paul said. That's consistent with every passage on salvation in the Bible 
faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone. And that becomes kind of a mantra, but it's, but they labor to, to defend this in view of what the Roman church had developed, which they thought was poisonous, was um, antichrist in those ways. So their big ideas uh, behind all the things that they're writing and all the, all the things that they're doing, salvation does not rest on a sacramental system with hope that you've got enough. But on the grace of God, through the work of Christ alone, over and over, and, and when we see the gospel proclamations and the response of those, say in the book of Acts, for example, we don't see the, the okay, now, you're partially there. Um, you got a lot of work to do to get, to, to, to get it. No, it's, uh, what must I do to be saved? Repent and believe. They're testifying Christ and what Christ did. For Christ died for your sins. Uh, and there's a major reworking and differences on sacraments. Now, truth be told, um, so there's four major camps of, of the reformers. Three of them still practice infant baptism. They still held to that. Um, and <laughs> no, they were serious about it. Uh, I know they're serious. That's why it's a problem. <laughs> you know, you baptize them now, you are comfortable. But if you don't have to baptize, then you're also comfortable. Mm. <laughs> well, the, uh, the Anabaptists were the lone wolves because they're no believers. Believer baptism. Um, you must have heard and 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 confess the gospel to be saved, then you're baptized. Um, and they were punished by everybody. So, but they're still, so they're, but they're still working this out. Um, all the, all the uh, Reformation camps and the splintering that happens from there um, addressing this. So there's new confessions of faith being written, <coughs> new creeds being written, <coughs> and a, uh, <coughs> A major component of those are what is salvation? Um, and what do the sacraments really mean? And there's major developments and distinctions and debates on order and elements on salvation. Right? So, okay, begins with God's grace. Um, and, uh, and then, um, uh, which come first? Uh, faith or repentance. So there's several different systems that, that lay that out. Here's the order, order salutis, the order of salvation, the order of how things happen. Um, even though that beginning point is a mystery to every single person. What's that? The efficacy of that story is the question. Yeah, that's right. Um, and <laughs> well, there's implications. There's implications in systems about about that for sure. Um, there's some that say faith comes from um, comes from uh, your declaration repent right so they, they there are some systems that put put that um, well is faith a gift or is faith something that you exercise and then you then you receive then the Holy Spirit changes your nature so regeneration when does that happen right so um, but at least the thing that they have right, 
I decided what the Roman church is doing is uh, by grace you are saved through faith. They're just arguing over how do you define each of those elements and where they fit in the, in the process. Um, seems to me that the, uh, the repentant belief, which is produced by uh, the work of the Holy Spirit as the gospel is being proclaimed is, you know, pretty much lays out in order. So I want to look just for a moment at, at uh, 1 Timothy. Um, so Paul's letter to Timothy, he's, he's passing the baton to Timothy. He's handing off stewardship of Ephesus to Timothy. And the first three chapters, um, he addresses things that are significant to uh, the stewardship of the gospel. Um, in the first chapter, he urges Timothy to have a clear commitment to the preaching and teaching of the plan of God. He uses that, that language. He means by that what God has accomplished through Christ. So, so he identifies people that are teaching things that don't matter, people are teaching things that aren't qualified to teach. Um, and, he, and he says, this is what you should, this is what you need to teach uh, from a sincere faith. Um, so chapter one is really all about that, all about reminding Timothy, keep your focus on proclaiming um, uh, God's uh, administration of his, of his eternal plan for salvation. Chapter two, he asks for prayer for those who are in authority. And then he adds, on, and all people, so that we may live quiet lives of godliness and dignity. But he doesn't stop there. He goes right after that to say, in view of the opportunity for the gospel, because God does desire those to be saved. And then he mentions about Christ. And so he wraps that prayer into um, you, you by the implication is you by being uh, have, living his lives of godliness and dignity will be effective to proclaim the gospel because that's what needs to be heard. So rather than rebel against those authorities, please pray for them and then all people as well. And then he introduces in two and three, um, he builds upon that idea of, of what godliness and dignity means by talking about the character of the church household. So he talks about men, women, elders, deacons. Um, and uh, even though he's giving those qualifications for elders and deacons, and he's describing how men and, and women should behave, at the end he says this, I'm writing the thing to you, hoping to, well, first let me finish, finish the, uh, um, what he says about deacons, because this is kind of a culminary statement. For those who have served well as deacons, obtain from them a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. And then he says, I'm writing things, these things to you. So what's he written about? He's written about, he's written about uh, clear teaching, clear proclamation of the gospel. He's written about prayer uh, for those who, ha who, who haven't heard the gospel. I'm writing something to you, hoping to come to you before long, but in case I'm delayed, I write that you will know how one should act in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. What truth is that? That's a truth about who God is. That's a truth about Christ. That's the truth about the gospel. Because he goes then to this beautiful little mini hymn on Christ. Beyond question, great is the mystery of godliness. Well, he told the people that he wanted them to live quiet lives in all godliness. This is great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit seen by angels, proclaimed among, among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. So Paul gives Timothy this huge um, message about the church's responsibility for the gospel by saying, teach, 
teach this. Pray. Pray for those so that your message will be heard. Behave in ways that reflect that you stand on the truth of the gospel. And here's our Savior. Remember what he did. And wouldn't that be a message, that little snippet that people would want to hear? Revealed in the flesh. That's John 1 in, in just a few words. Vindicated in the Spirit. Seen by angels. Proclaimed among the nations. That's happening. It's happening now. Believed on in the world. Taken up in glory. That's a good... Um, a good three chapters to read. The whole, the whole letter is important, but he takes that break there with this, and that's what pieces the rest of it before together, I think. Um, because it reminds us of our responsibility. Make sure teaching is, 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 is well done. Don't get distracted by these useless speculations. Make sure the teaching is solidly on God, Christ, God's plan, Pray. Think about how you're living. How the household of God is living. Because this is where the truth resides. In God's administration. So real quick, practical implications. Clear and straightforward gospel. Clear and straightforward gospel. That's what needs to be. That needs to indwell our thinking needs to be clear when we talk to people about it. I really like what you said about, um, I was doing part two, but part one needed to be, <laughs> to be in that, in that sharing. Um, growing awareness of the gospel questions and objections and how to biblically address those things. That's what the early church was doing. That's what that generation was doing. How do we respond to this? And the scholastics were trying, but they had already bought into advancing a system that wasn't truly the gospel. And listen to how the world speaks. Listen and think about how to respond. All right. By grace, we are saved through faith in Christ Jesus because Christ died for our sins. I'll just add Jesus to the shelf. Yeah. Yeah. And not everyone, you can't cast that across because there were actually some Hindus by culture, but they were believers in Christ and had set aside other gods. They were your weight to the word. Yeah. But um, you have to listen and figure out what are they really saying? Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to... Uh, um, Minimize what this classics are trying to do um, to say this. It is important that we think about what, what the words in the gospel mean. It really is, right? To grow in our understanding of what those words mean in Scripture really is. Um, not to just get so absorbed in it that that's all you ever think about. Oh, grace, let me just... Um, but to understand those words... Um, you know, Paul at one point said it's pretty simple. But what, how God accomplished it through Christ is pretty amazing. Um, and the more you think about that, by God's grace, um, 
and who God is, that he would, who's the judge, he, that he would provide for salvation through his son, by God's grace. All right. Any other thoughts or comments or questions or corrections? <laughs> Okay. Well, come back next week. We'll talk about hope. We'll hit part three. Christ died for our sins. Man, I have a testimony. Oh, but the hope of the resurrection. <laughs> talk about that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You definitely want to get that right, or you, or none of this is some of our hopes are pretty short-sighted and pretty self-absorbed and pretty, um, yeah, yeah. True enough. Okay, well, let me pray and send you on your way. Father, thank you so much for the grace that you supplied to provide us salvation through your son. There is none but him that were born in this world without sin. And uh, your grace Necessary might not be the right word because it implies something that you had to do. No, this was your plan. Um, and we are grateful and thankful to know that you, from eternity past, intended for your son to come. And Father, we're grateful. And uh, we pray that... Uh, that this church, this people, would become more um, aware of how to speak the gospel in hopes that by your grace, through faith, from the Spirit in Christ, they would be saved. Help us rest well tonight. Praise in Christ's name. Amen.